So I pray that as we go into this morning's message, that the Lord will speak to us. Uh, it may be a little stiff, but I, I believe I'm not speaking, the Holy Ghost is speaking. Amen? And sometimes when He speaks, He rebukes, He corrects, He exhorts. And so, let Him have His way. Shall we pray? Father, we thank You for this morning. We thank you, dear God, that as we go into your word, that you'll minister to us. Lord, we are ready for correction. Lord, we want to open our hearts this morning, Lord, to receive as you would speak to us. And therefore, Lord, I ask you, Lord, to anoint my lips and to anoint the ears of those that will hear what the Spirit of God has to say. In Jesus' name. Amen. I have found out that um, sometimes we ignore certain things in the Bible when we read it, simply because we most often, you know, don't take it very serious. But um, I don't think we should be ignoring because when we follow the scriptures and try to be absolutely obedient to scriptures, we get God's blessing. Amen? God has no choice but to bless us. And God wants to bless us. And there are so many promises in the Bible. It says if you are obedient, and if you do everything that I commanded you this day, says the Lord, these blessings shall come upon you and shall overtake you. Amen? So we want to be the recipients of God's blessing. We want God to bless us. We want to be above and not beneath. We want to be the head and not the tail. And we want to be lenders and not borrowers. Can you say amen? That's what God wants to do. So, having said that, uh, we're going to go into the book of Leviticus chapter 4, verse 20. And he shall do with the bullocks as he did with the bullocks for a sin offering, so shall he do with this. And the priest shall make an atonement for them, and it shall be forgiven them. I want you to look at one word that is uh, consistent in all the verses that we're going to read. Verse 26 says, And it shall burn all its fat upon the altar as a fat of sacrifice or peace offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for and concerning for his sins, and it shall be forgiven them. Verse 31, And the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven. The last verse, verse 35, According to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord, the priest shall make an atonement for his sin that he, sh that he has committed, and it shall I read four verses in one chapter that talks about forgiveness and it shall be forgiven now I want you to differentiate two different words all the four verses forgiven but now let's go to chapter 12 we'll read verse 8 and if she be not able to bring a lamb then she shall bring two turtle doves and two young pigeons one for the burnt offering and the other for the sin offering and the priest shall make an atonement for her, and she shall be? Okay. Let's go to another reference in chapter 14, verse 19. And the priest shall offer the sin offering and make an atonement for him that is to be cleansed from his uncleanness. And afterwards he shall kill the burnt offering, verse 20. And the priest shall offer burnt offering and the meat offering upon the altar. And the priest shall make an atonement for him, for he shall be. I found out there are two words. One word, forgiven. And the other word, clean. How many of you would agree they're two separate words? They're not one and the same. So, having read these verses... I found out that there is a consistent pattern from the Old Testament all the way into the New Testament that two things have to happen in the life of a believer. Number one, we must have forgiveness. 
How does forgiveness come? When we cry out for the mercy of God as a sinner, and we go to God, by His mercy, He forgives us. But I could be forgiven, I also need to be clean. Forgiveness is one thing, to be clean is another thing. We have many Christians who have forgiveness of sins, but have not arrived to the place where they are actually clean. The sacrifice of Jesus and the blood of Jesus Christ forgives us and cleans us. We don't stop at being forgiven. We progress to being clean. The Word of God is what brings conviction. How many of you have been convicted when you read the Word of God? And you found out the word of God is showing us something that we have been doing that we should not do. There's some sin that we have that we should not have. You have been convicted. So the word of God brings conviction. Conviction brings repentance. Repentance brings forgiveness. Can you see the process so well? Amen. But the blood of Jesus Christ washes us and makes us clean. Amen? So which means I came to the Lord and I said to the Lord, Lord, please forgive me of my sin. Lord, I call upon your name. Lord, I have sinned. Please forgive me. Forgiveness comes. Now, the next thing what I need to do is to have the blood of Jesus Christ to wash me. Now, I am not saying that the blood does not come initially to wash us exactly at the same time in which we are crying out forgiveness. I did not say that. We have the blood. But as I would read scriptures, and I will show you right now, the blood of Jesus Christ is so sacred. It's so holy. The Bible calls it precious blood. Because of its sacredness, and because of its holiness, it cannot come upon flesh that is sinful. Are you with me? But my brother, my sister, as I cry out to God for his mercy, and I ask him to forgive me of my sin, because I cried out to God for his mercy, he forgives me. And the moment he forgives me, I am forgiven. Then the blood of Jesus Christ comes upon me, and when his blood comes upon me, his blood flows into my spirit, into my soul, and looks at every creek and every crevice and every uh, you know, spot in, in, in me and begins to wash every sin. I am perfectly clean by the blood of Jesus. That's what his blood does. And not only does his blood, his blood clean us, but his blood thereafter remains upon us, and we are covered by the blood. And when a child of God is covered by the blood of the Lamb, my brother, my sister, the devil cannot put a little finger on you. He cannot. I say he cannot. He fears the blood. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Do you have the blood of the Lamb upon you this morning? Maybe, Pastor, I think... I'm not sure. No, we must have the blood. And his blood will come upon you if you are clean. His blood cannot come upon anything that's not clean. I will show you from the scripture in a moment from now. Let's go to chapter 14. We are in chapter 14 of the book of Leviticus. And let's read the first three verses. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest, and the priest shall go forth, where? Out of the camp. Now, in Bible days, if there was a person who had leprosy, he was excommunicated. He had to leave the camp, and he had to live outside, out of the city. Why? It is not just a stigma. I want you to know that leprosy is not just a disease found 
in a person's body known as a disease. The, the reason for leprosy is because of the heart condition. Number one, do you remember Miriam? She mocked Moses. She spoke against the man of God. She spoke ill against him. She said, do you think you're the only one? Is there, isn't there anyone else? And the moment she was mocking and ridiculing the man of God, she was struck with leprosy. So it was not a disease that she had, which we might call it a disease, but because of her heart condition, she got leprosy. So this is externally because of what happened internally. I'm looking at another man who was a, a king. He walked into the temple and he opposed the priest over there and he told the priest, let me offer sacrifices. And the priest said, no, you can't do it. You're not supposed to do this. You're not called to do this. And he pushed him aside and he went. And the moment he did that, he was struck with leprosy. Amen? Now, you and I, once upon a time, were lepers. Amen? Now, you may say, well, pastor, how can you say I'm a, I'm a leper? I, I don't have leprosy. No, we are lepers on the inside. We had leprosy on the inside. And because of that kind of a leprosy, we were out of the camp. We were not part of the congregation. We were outside. Now, the verse that I just read, if a man is healed of leprosy, which means possibly that this man cried out to God for the mercy of God, and said, Lord, forgive me of whatever sin that I would have committed. And maybe because of that, he was healed of leprosy. Because I don't think they had good medical science then as we have today. So it was the mercy of God that healed that man. And then the Bible says, if you find a man that's healed of leprosy, you know, the priest has to go out of the camp and certify and find out whether or not this man has been healed of leprosy. And if the priest will examine him and find out that he's healed of leprosy, he says, okay, now come at the door. You don't come in, you come at the door. And for time's sake, we're not going to read the rest of the scriptures. But the Bible says, as this man comes who has been cleaned of leprosy, first thing what the priest does, he washes him. Amen. The Bible says, in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, that the word of God is like water. We have received a bath, a spiritual bath, when I read the word of God and I came to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. God has washed our sins away through his word. I never got convicted because I heard about the blood. I got convicted when I heard the gospel. Amen? Yes, the blood also brings conviction, but the gospel convicts people. When the gospel is preached, people come in repentance. So I heard the gospel for the first time many, many years ago, even before I got married. And when I heard the gospel, I was convicted of sin. It's only then I knew, until then I thought I was a righteous man. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do this, I don't do that, you know, I don't do all the bad things, and so therefore I thought I was righteous, you know, living a good life and doing good things, to my understanding, was righteousness, and I thought maybe because of that I'm going to heaven, but how sadly mistaken I was, you know, those things don't take me to heaven. There's only one thing that takes me to heaven, and Jesus Christ said, I am the way. There's no other way, but except Jesus Christ, the reason being because Jesus Christ is the only person in the entire universe that gave his life as a sacrifice for the world, shed his blood, my brother, my sister, and then he says to you and me, he says, there's no other way. I am the way because I made the way for you. Amen. Amen. So that's the gospel, and I accepted the gospel, and I got saved. And then, when I got saved, then I knew that now I am part of the flock of God. I was out of the camp, but now I'm brought in. You were out of the camp, but now you're seated in the four walls of this building. You know you're part of the flock of God. Amen? 
Now what happens, the priest after having washed him, then what the priest does, he takes a sacrificed animal and then he begins to sprinkle the blood of that animal upon the man that has been washed. And when he sprinkles, then he looks at that man, I just read verse 19 and 20, he announces to that man, he says, now you are being made clean. So what I'm trying to say this morning, that before this message is over, and before we leave this church door, we are going to ask the Lord to clean us. I'm forgiven, but Lord, I need to be clean. What makes you clean? What can make you white as snow? Nothing but the blood of the Lamb. Amen. It's only the blood of the Lamb that could make us white as snow. It's only the crimson blood of Jesus Christ that could wash us inside out. Wash a person who has been forgiven to clean the person totally. Tradition says that Lazarus was one of the ten lepers that came to Jesus Christ after they were healed. Remember ten lepers came to Jesus? And so when they came, they cried out for the mercy of God. Then Jesus Christ just told them one thing. He says, go and show yourself to the priest. Why did he say that? Because let's have in mind that during that time, Jesus Christ had not yet died. He was not yet sacrificed. His blood was not yet shed. So according to the law of Moses, he said, go and show yourself to the priest. Why must you show yourself to the priest? Because they have the lepers removed. So all ten of them went, but one leper returned back. Now when this one leper returned back, what was he coming for? He was coming with gratitude, he was coming with praise, he was coming with thanksgiving, he was more than excited and he was coming to Jesus Christ, but the other nine took it for granted. Not this one man. When he came to Jesus, Jesus looked at him and asked him, where are the other nine? He said, I don't know a lot, but I came to you. And only one man, well, it was being said to, he says, go and you are being made whole. Amen? Not the other nine. And so according to tradition, it, this man was Lazarus, and that's why Lazarus lived in Bethany. The word Bethany is the Hebrew word, Beth is house, Honey is poor. Amen? It's house of the poor. House of the poor meaning in Bethany is where lepers lived once upon a time. So Lazarus is from Bethany. And my brother, my sister, because of that, because he came to Jesus Christ and he was made whole, that's the reason why when he died, Jesus Christ raised him back to life. Amen? Are you listening to what I'm telling you? When you are covered by the blood, my brother, my sister, even though what seems to be dead, God can resurrect it once again. Amen. God can make miracles. God can do wonders. You know, most of the time, whenever Jesus Christ was walking through, uh, passing that area, he would stop at Lazarus' home, have a meal over there. Remember, Mary and Martha will always squabble. Mary will say, I mean, she sits at the feet of Jesus, but Martha was busy in the kitchen cooking a meal for Jesus. And both of them will have a, you know, a little argument. But Jesus Christ will go to the house and he'll have a meal with them. My brother, my sister, how would you like it to have Jesus Christ to be seated at your table and having a meal along with you even though he may be unseen? So Lazarus, symbolically speaking, he was one person that was not just forgiven but being made whole. Now I found out something else as well. Chapter 15, verse 31. Thus shall he separate the children of Israel from uncleanness. Now listen. That they die not in the uncleanness when they defile my tabernacle that is among them. I read that verse last night, I think more than 20 times trying to get out what that verse was trying to say. Because when I read that verse, I was a little worried. I said, Lord, please tell me what you meant by this verse. And as I read it and read it and read it, this is what the Lord said to me. 
and what the Lord told me, I'm telling you. So I'm not telling you, the Lord is telling us. Amen? The scripture says over here, my brother, my sister, sometimes because of our lifestyle, a compromising lifestyle, we are indulging with unholiness. We come to the sanctuary. We are seated here this morning. You hear the word. We ignore correction. We go back and live the same life and come back again. We go and come back. We go and come back. Ignoring what God is trying to say to us. Listen. If this happens consistently and happens on a regular basis, God does not show up in the church. I have all the reasons to tell you why. Because God and unholy lifestyle do not coexist. Are you with me? But there could be one, there could be two, three, or less than that. That live an unholy lifestyle. And the other 99 are crying out to God. And the heart of God goes out to the 99, but he abhors the one that is living a compromising lifestyle. And this is what the Lord will say. How can I deny my presence for the 99 for the sake of the one? So therefore, I'm not going to go. I'll make that one to go. Am I making sense this morning? You may say, Pastor, you're going overboard. No, I want to keep you on board. Amen? I've not preached like this before. But I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to speak using my lips. Church, today is the message of warning. And I'll show you from scriptures. I'm not just speaking you know, out of my head. So the scripture says, because of the one God doesn't want to deny the blessing to the 99, he would not stop, but he would stop that one from coming. You want a scripture for that? In the book of Joshua chapter 7, in verse 1 and 2, let's read it. But the children of Israel, now listen, the children of Israel, can you look at that over there? The children of Israel had committed a trespass against the accursed thing, for Achan, the son of Kamai, the son of Zavdi, the son of Zerah, out of the tribe of Judah, had taken an accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled not upon Achan, but upon the congregation. So then the Bible says, when, you know, no one knew what was happening, no one knew what this guy Achan did, he had committed a trespass, and then, you know, Joshua so happily comes out, and he says, we're going to send just a few people to go and spy out Ahai, you know, the country, it's just next door, you know, spy out, because Ahai, you know, is, is the threshold to the promised land. So we're going to spy out that place, and I'm going to send but just a few guys, let them go. And so the few of them went, and when they went, you know, Joshua was so confident because of all the victories that he had, he knew that he was going to have one more victory, but when these men went to spy out the land, they came running, and they were weeping, and this is what they told to Joshua. They said, Joshua, not only we were, we were beaten, but as we are running down the hill, they were beating us. So they turned their backs against the enemies and came running. Joshua fell on his face, crying out to God, Lord, please tell me why. And so he was praying and fasting. And in the middle of his prayer and the fast, the Lord said to Joshua, get up, Joshua. You can pray till you die. You will never have victory because of sin in the camp. Are you listening, church? There could be sin in the camp this morning. And because there's sin in the camp, you will never have victory. And Joshua prayed, and the Lord showed Joshua, this man Achan. And when this man Achan had committed the trespass, what happened? He had to leave. 
he left. And then you read in chapter 8, verse 1, the Lord says to Joshua, Now you go to Ai, for I have already given the land to you. Amen. You read in the verses down, it says, Before they chased you, but now you will chase them. Are you with me, church? So this is what happens. Shall I give you another verse of scripture from the New Testament? Go to chapter 5 of the book of Acts. Okay, I'm reading verse 10. And she fell down straight away at his feet and healed it the ghost. And young men came in and found her dead and carried her forth, buried her by her husband. Now what had happened was, uh, the verses prior to this, that uh, Ananias, he comes now not knowing, you know, his wife never knew what was happening in the church. So Ananias comes to Peter, Peter was a pastor, and he comes and he brings some money and he gives it to Peter. He said, this is the money that I have received after having sold my property. Full payment. The Lord revealed it to Peter. This man is saying a lie. And so Peter looked at him and said, Ananias, this was your own property. You could have given how much you want, or you could have even kept it for yourself. It doesn't matter. But you lied unto the Holy Ghost, not to man. And this man dropped dead. Now, they buried him, and a little later, his wife, when she comes and not knowing what happened, she says, oh, I want you to know that, you know, we sold our property. They said, no, wait, wait, let us ask you a question. Did you sell and brought all the money? She said, yes, everything. I said, okay. Here are the feet that just buried your husband. They're going to take you also to the graveyard. She dropped dead. Now, you may say, Pastor, can God be so mean? Because he, they never gave him money, he took their lives. Now, that is not the reason. Why does God have to take somebody's life because they never gave money? Don't you know that God owns a cattle on a thousand hills? Don't you know all the gold and the silver is his? Don't you know even if he wants to close the Swiss bank, he can close it? <laughs> Amen? Everything belongs to the Lord. There's nothing that the Lord lacks. He is the creator of the universe. Amen? So therefore, he never took their life because they never gave money. The major problem was they conceived sin on the inside. Amen? That was sin. And God will not tolerate sin. Are you listening, church? Now, this was such a shock in the church over there. You know, they were all really shocked. And so I'm reading verse 11, and great fear came upon the church and upon many as heard these things. Fear, the fear of the Lord came upon the church. Now, look at verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders wrought among the people and they were all in one accord in Solomon's sports. My brother, my sister, when God begins to deal, the church begins to change. But I'm saying this morning, why should we change what well, God can deal? Amen? Now look, look, at, look at the next verse. Verse 13. And of the rest does no man join himself to them, but people magnify them, and the believers were handed unto the Lord multitudes, both men and women, as much as they brought the sick people into the streets and laid them on the beds and the couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by may heal them. And the Bible says, and there came a great multitude out of the cities round about Jerusalem, bringing the sick folks, and they, and they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. What is it that stopped the move of God? Sin. What is it that released the move of God when sin leaves? Are you listening, church? So what I'm saying this morning, that we need to come to a place of total surrender. Amen? And when we come to that place and ask the Lord to clean us, not only for, to forgive us, but to clean us, that's when we will see God move in a mighty way. Now, I'm closing, but as I close, 
I want to give you some good news. The good news is, again in chapter 14 of the book of Leviticus, it says the man was washed, the blood came upon him, and after that the oil came upon him. Amen? Without washing, no blood. Without the blood, no anointing. My brother, my sister, how many of us want to walk away this morning knowing that we are clean and knowing that we are being anointed? Can I have your hands up, please? We all want to. Amen? Well, pastor, what does the anointing do? I'll tell you what the anointing does. When God anointed David, the Bible says David was anointed. And when the anointing of God came upon David, not only was David anointed for service, not only was he empowered to do things for God, but the anointing that came upon David, you know, made a shield round about David. And my brother, my sister, David is one man that fought the most number of battles recorded in the Bible. And David is the only man that I find not a scratch on his body. God will make a shield round about you. No matter what the enemy does, no matter what the enemy tries, if God be for you, who can stand against you? Amen. Amen. Today we want to walk out because we are walking back and from tomorrow, Monday, till we come back next Sunday, we are out in a world that is so polluted, there's so much of contamination, there's so much of wickedness outside, and we are in the midst of all this wickedness and contamination, but we thank God the anointing protects us. The anointing is a shield round about us. Amen. The anointing teaches us the word of God. The anointing empowers us. And if the devil fears one thing, not just a child of God, he fears the anointing upon the child of God. Shall we all stand, please? I pray this morning that, that we have not just heard a message or another message, I've spoken the word of God. And I believe this morning it was not me speaking. If it was me, I would not have said all these things. But it was the Spirit of the living God speaking to us. Why? He loves us. He wants to take us to another level. He wants to see the blessing of God upon our lives. The Spirit of God knows that the enemy is waiting out for us to take us. But when we go out anointed, when we go out clean, when we go out washed by the blood of the Lamb, the enemy fears us. This morning, I'd like you to lift your hands up towards heaven. And wherever you're standing, I want you to pray this prayer with me, and after which, I'm going to ask the Lord to anoint us. But please pray this prayer with me. Mean it from your heart. Mean every word. If you don't mean it, do not pray this prayer. You can just keep quiet. But others, I want you to pray. Say it along with me. Heavenly Father, I stand before you. I heard you speak to me. This morning, O oh God, all my shortcomings, all my failures, all my disappointments, whatever sin I would have sinned, knowing or unknowingly, whether big or small, I strip it away from my life. Dear God, help me to take every sin, not a single sin to remain in my life, to take every sin, and I want to put it in a bag, and I want to tie a millstone around it, and I want to throw it in the deepest ocean, never to take it back again. I repent of everything and anything that I've done that has displeased thee and this morning oh God I cry out for your mercy forgive me of everything that I did and this morning I stand here oh God and I call upon you to wash me with the precious blood of Jesus So that not only am I forgiven, but I'm also clean. And when I'm clean, I can come into your presence. And above all, 
you can come into my presence. We can have a relationship. And now, O oh God, I ask you to anoint me. Lord, I ask you to pour that oil of anointing from the top of my head and let it flow down like it came down Aaron's beard and covered Aaron from top to bottom. May your anointing cover us today so that your anointing will protect us. Your anointing will empower us to do even greater things than what I did. I thank you that by faith my prayer is heard and by faith I am clean and by faith I am anointed. Now thank the Lord. Give him a big hand. Amen. Oh, I feel something happened this morning. Something has happened in this church. Something has happened to this congregation. Amen. You are going to see greater days ahead. May the Lord bless you this morning. Father, we thank you once again, O God, for this precious morning. Thank you, Lord, for the word came to us straight and direct from you, O God. Lord, may we continue to live godly lives. Father, yes, O God, sometimes in our weaknesses we fall. But Father, help us in our weaknesses to be strengthened, O God. Lord, that your strength will become our strength, O God. Help us, O God, not to, uh, not to slip, Lord, knowing or even unknowingly, but to walk circumspectly, O God. Bless this congregation this morning. And once again, O God, this word came to the fathers. But Lord, we, the fathers, will take up the challenge, O God. Lord, to be an example and a testimony, not only in our homes, Lord, but to our community as well, O God. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. We give you all the praise, the glory, and honor. In the name of Jesus we pray.